Hi, welcome to Real Progressives, MMT Mondays. I'm Jeff Ginter, your host. Uh, tonight, we're putting forward a, a shorter video, uh, this time with Randy Ray. Uh, and he's doing everything you wanted to know about uh, MMT. I think it's officially entitled Everything You Need to Know About MMT. Every time I say that, I think of the uh, Woody Allen movie, Everything You Wanted to Know About Sex But Were Afraid to Ask. So, tonight, enjoy Randy Ray. Everything you wanted to know about MMT, but were afraid to ask. We'll be back afterwards. The topic today is everything you wanted to know about modern monetary theory. I'm Christina Lindblad. I'm the economics editor of Bloomberg Business Week magazine. I'm joined today by Peter Coy, way on my left, uh, who was our senior economics writer, and by Randall Ray, who is one of the most important uh, voices and proponents uh, writing about modern monetary theory. So. At a time when Republicans and Democrats seem to have lost uh, interest in deficit control, um, MMT proponents uh, kick it up a notch by um, saying that the U.S., in particular countries that issue their own currency, have a much greater capacity to spend because they can also issue debt in their own currency. Um, this um, um, doctrine or theory has been around for several years, but it's getting a lot of attention in the last few years, and there's a lot of debate, and I would say a lot of confusion, right, about what MMT is. So today we're going to try to clear some of that up. So um, just before we get started, some housekeeping. There's a question window on the right side of your webcast console, so please send your questions um, as we're talking, and we'll, and we'll get to those uh, not too long into our webcast. So let's get started. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for inviting me. So I think um, the first thing I'd like you to do is just give a brief description of what MMT is all about. OK, well, first, let me say that what we argue is that a sovereign government that issues its own currency is actually nothing like a household or a firm, even though we hear this analogy all the time. If a government issues its own currency, um, and uh, imposes tax liabilities or other kinds of liabilities in that currency, and uh, spends only in its own currency, and issues debt only in its own currency, then it basically can never run out of money. That is the, the basic of the argument. So what, is it, what do you mean by never run out of its own money? Spell that out a little bit. It's always able to make all payments as they come due. So any payment that it is promised to make, whether it's your Social Security retirement pay or it is interest payments on government debt denominated in its own currency, it can always make those payments. By doing what? <laughs> <laughs> well, the way it used to work is that the government actually would print up the currency mm -hmm. or stamp the coins and make the payments. Mm -hmm. Today it's all handled electronically. Um, and. So I don't know if we want to get into nitty gritty details, but the way that uh, the U.S. Treasury spends is by uh, having the Fed credit the reserves of a bank, mm -hmm. and that bank credits the deposit of the recipient of the government spending. That's how all government spending uh, occurs today. Yeah. So the one question uh, that everybody asks about MMT is, well, does that mean there's no limit at all to how much the government can spend? What's the answer to that one? <laughs> well, the limit would be the resources available for the government to hire or purchase. And how is that limited? Well, we, we do have um, you know, a limited number. It's a very large number. A limited number of workers available. We have a limited uh, number of natural resources that could be put to use uh, to pursue the public purpose. Um, so it, the, the government can't run out of finance, right. but the United States could run out of uh, uh, resources that are available. And how will we know when we're hitting up against that limit? Well, we will start to get inflation. Okay. And so there is an inflation barrier, and we need to worry about that. Okay. I think inflation is one of the things people often are concerned about when they read about MMT. Yes. We often hear about, well, the Weimar Republic is, is yeah. one people ask, or Venezuela, which is a more recent example. So I don't know if you want to just take a couple of minutes to uh, explain how these are different kinds of... Yeah. When we say that the government can't run out of money, we're not saying the government should spend without limit. 
the government should be constrained by a budget. So Congress uh, puts together a budget, the president signs it, that tells us how much the Treasury is allowed to spend for the year. And this is a good thing. When we uh, formulate the budget, we need to consider resource availability. How close are we to full employment? Uh, once we start getting close to full employment, uh, we don't want to increase government spending unless you know, there's a very good reason to move resources out of the private use and into the government use, such as a world war. During a world war, that is what we do. So right. we will uh, impose taxes, we will have a uh, bond saving uh, campaign, patriotic saving. Uh, we will use rationing if necessary. We will use wage and price controls if necessary in a war in order to move more resources to the government sector without causing inflation. If we don't do those things and the government keeps ramping up its spending, we will get inflation. Right. And does MMT have anything to say about where we are today? I mean, how close is, say, the United States to that point where it can't spend anymore? Yeah, well, it's pretty clear that uh, we still have slack in the economy. We have sufficient slack to increase government spending. And uh, you know, even uh, the chairman of the Fed admitted that recently in questioning. The, the old thinking was that you couldn't get the unemployment rate below about 6%, uh, the official measure of the unemployment rate. Right without sparking inflation. But we've seen year after year, we've lowered the unemployment rate mm -hmm. uh, below 4%, and we still don't have any inflation pressure that's visible, which tells me there's still a lot of slack. Now, I think the official uh, unemployment measure uh, leaves out many people who don't have jobs and want to work, or who are part-time employed and want full-time jobs. So uh, I think that, that that number is misleading. The we ha have looked into this, and it looks like there are between 12 and 15 million people, probably, who would take a full-time job mm -hmm. uh, if it were available. And that would equate to what kind of an official unemployment rate? That's hard. Again, because the official unemployment rate... Excludes uh, those people. From, it it yeah. excludes... Uh, about two thirds of the the people that I'm counting as yeah. people who would want a job. Um, I think that you know if a job were available, then uh, we will get down to what's called frictional uh, unemployment: people between jobs, people who just graduate from college. Right. I think it'll be in the one or two percent range. We talked about people's misconceptions about what countries you know. Um, associated with MMT. I mean, are there any countries today that sort of practice anything close? <laughs> okay. All the major countries in the world that will immediately come to people's minds already operate MMT. They already do. They have sovereign currencies. Right. Okay. They issue their own currency. They impose taxes in their own currency. They collect their own currency in payment of taxes. And they issue bonds in their own currency. All of those are MMT countries. The United States, Britain, China, Japan, these are all MMT countries. Um, all of the European nations that, that joined the Euro were all MMT countries before they joined the Euro. And right. then they adopted essentially a foreign currency. Um, and so uh, people think that we're, we're describing a new policy, we're not. We are describing reality. We're describing the way the US government spends, the way the British government spends. Okay? Now, we do have policy recommendations that go beyond that. So changing some of the policies um, in order to have the economy work better. What would be one of the, the most prominent ones? Well, the one that MMT is most associated with is the job guarantee program, which is a, um, a program that would offer a job to anyone who wants one. Okay, an unconditional, universal offer of a job to anyone who wants to work. Uh, that's the job guarantee. We can go into a lot more detail. Well, one version of that calls for a minimum a wage of something like $15 an hour, is that right? Well, so we can set the wage uh, either at the current minimum wage or we could set it at the $15 an hour, mm -hmm. which many people are pushing for. 
And uh, this is something that uh, I think most MMT advocates uh, agree with. The $15 an hour wage phased in over four years, so we would move it up from the current minimum wage within four years, get up to the $15 an hour. But the point is, you can have a job guarantee with any wage that you want. Right. Now, one of the criticisms of that that people say is that if you had a number way up like that, it would really hurt a lot of private sector employers because they would lose all their people who are getting paid yeah. less than that. Okay, look, we, we need to separate two things. One is raising the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. So there are many people advocating raising the minimum wage $15 an hour. Yeah. Many uh, states and cities have increased their own minimum wages and they're getting close to $15 an hour. Yeah. Within four years, I predict, $15 an hour will be a minimum wage in much of the country, if not the whole country, okay? If we put in place the job guarantee at the same time, phase it in at the same time, raise the wages in the job guarantee program in step with that phase in of the $15 an hour wage, actually with the job guarantee, there's less impact on the private sector uh, because we have higher employment and that increases aggregate demand. Mm -hmm. That increases the ability of the private sector to afford $15 an hour by ensuring we're at full employment all the time. So it actually, the job guarantee eases the phase in of the $15 an hour minimum wage. Okay. I wonder if you would talk a bit about how MMT evolved as a theory um, in, in academic circles and also had outside uh, people who are interested also in, in funding research and also t in uh, developing the theory. Yeah, because right, it seems to <laughs> a lot of us like it just dropped like out it of came nowhere. Out of, yeah, okay. yeah. Well, it started about 25 years ago. Um, and there was a, one of these very early internet discussion groups. I don't even remember what they were called back then. Um, <clears throat> the post-Keynesian uh, thought discussion group. And Bill Mitchell and I were on that, uh, along with a lot of other heterodox economists. Say who Bill Mitchell is. Okay, Bill Mitchell is the, one of the developers of MMT in Australia. Mm -hmm. And he has a very well-known blog called Billy Blog. He writes every day, MMT, thousands of words. Um, so anyway, we were on this discussion group, and we were discussing the kinds of things post-Keynesians and other heterodox economists discuss. And this guy named Warren Mosler came on. And apparently, he was sent there by Art Laffer, who said, I think your ideas sound a lot like post-Keynesian. And so Warren came on, and there were lots of similarities, but also he had some uniquely different ways of viewing some things. And he would post them, and uh, I think Bill and I and a couple other people said, yeah, he's using different words, but we see what he's saying, and he's right. Many other people said, this guy is crazy. Well, let's stop for a second. I'll also tell people who Warren Mosler is. Okay, Warren Mosler was a um, sovereign debt bond guy, uh, hedge fund guy, um, who had independently come to these ideas on his own. Mm -hmm. So he was not an academically right. trained economist at all. Um, so we sort of took our discussion off the side. And uh, we discussed with Warren, and we started getting together. We would meet uh, just about every year mm -hmm. in Australia or in America and um, work on advancing the theory. And we would go to conferences. We would do all the things academic economists do. And every year, we would meet with Warren. And he'd say, OK, how many people get it now? You know, and we'd say, well, I, we, we think we're up to five. <laughs> and a year later, well, a couple years later, we're up to 10. Um, and uh, it was very tough going. 10 years ago, no, sorry, uh, 12 years ago, at a, a meeting at Warren's house, Bill and I, he was encouraging Bill and I to write a textbook. And we finally mm -hmm. agreed to do it. 12 years ago, we started writing the textbook. OK? And it just came out. Is that, um, let me that's what's uh, over there. I wasn't here. trying to long <laughs> gestation, the long gestation period. <laughs> this is the textbook. came out this year. And uh, so anyway, that was you know, uh, a way to try to advance it in the economic curriculum. Um, 
we did journal articles and lots of other stuff, and it's been a very uh, long road. And, and do you think that reflects partly how fast change comes about in the field of economics, that it's hard for people to yes. give up their old? Yeah, you know, Warren wasn't an academic economist, and, and he thought that you know we'd hold a conference, we'd explain it clearly, and everyone would get it and go home, and they'd all adopt it. We didn't call it MMT back then, but you know what we now call MMT. It wasn't that way at all, and uh, I was always skeptical because I know academic economists have spent years and years of study in a PhD program, years devoted to writing their dissertation. They don't easily change their minds. Mm -hmm. And so I knew it was going to be a long road, but uh, it was much more difficult than I thought. Than you expected. Um, and it's still difficult with academic economists. What, what happened uh, to get the ideas out was the development of blogs. So Bill developed a blog, and then Stephanie Kelton, who was my colleague, colleague at um, University of Missouri, Kansas City, started a blog, and this is how the ideas got out. It, it wasn't through academics, it wasn't through the conferences. Those were almost a complete bust. It was the blogs. Well, in a way, your textbook could not have come out at a better time, so it's probably good that it didn't come out 10 years <laughs> yeah, ago, that's, maybe. That's, uh, because the, my next question is, what do you think it is about this moment that now people, you know, it's, it's amazing to, to go from, like you say, having this sort of kind of pushback, even for in your own profession, to people saying MMT like it's, you know, it's already an acronym, you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the, the blog spread the word, and there literally are tens of thousands of followers now who understand the basics of MMT, and some of them way beyond the basics. I mean, they, they really could go head to head and, I think, win a debate with Paul Krugman easily. Uh, I mean, on the merits of the arguments. Mm -hmm. um, there are thousands of people like that now. There are you know, movements, populist movements in some countries, especially in Italy, where there are thousands of followers, populist movements where uh, Warren Mosler can fill a, f a football soccer stadium in Italy. People coming out to hear MMT. Imagine that. Yeah. Uh, but w what happened in America really was um, Bernie Sanders and AOC. Uh, Stephanie Kelton uh, became an advisor to, to Bernie Sanders, and then uh, AOC picked up MMT and got it out in a way that um, you know, we couldn't do. And I think, uh, just to help people understand, it's not so much that they've been talking about the particulars of the, of the theory, right? But it's also because they've linked it to, as a way of financing particular platforms that are, become important to certain groups of, of the population. And I think the Green New Deal is probably one of the most yes. well-known. Yes, so saying you know, we're not going to play that pay-for game anymore. Yes, but yeah, uh, I know you've said it already, but talk again about what that means. the pay for theory is and why that's you don't buy into it. Okay, well, the, the way most people think is that the federal government needs to get the tax revenue before it can spend. Okay, and what we argue is that you know that's never been true. Mm -hmm. uh, all the way back to colonial America. The, the government spends first and then collects back its currency and tax payment. So you spend, then collect back the tax revenue. You don't really spend tax revenue. Today, since um, tax revenue just reverses the process that I uh, talked about before, the Fed debits your bank's reserves and your bank debits your demand deposit whenever you pay taxes. Really what happens is it's a destruction of money. It destroys your demand deposit by crossing it off the spreadsheet. That is how uh, taxes are paid. There's nothing there for the government to spend. The government spends by crediting accounts. So it's entries on balance sheets. Um, so just as a, you know, a, a matter of fact, governments don't spend tax revenue. Back when they used to issue paper money, governments actually burned the tax revenue. Every dollar that they received, they would burn. 
okay? Redemption of the currency, that's what it was called. Um, so governments don't really spend tax revenue anyway. The purpose of the taxes is to create a demand for the money, and the, the purpose of removing that money from the economy is to prevent inflation. And so uh, let's say we have a Green New Deal, and let's say that it, that it costs, uh, the government is going to spend an amount equal to 5% of GDP. That's my, mm -hmm. we have a, a paper at the Levy Institute that, that goes through an estimate of what mm. we think it will take to implement a Green New Deal. It's about 5% of GDP. So we're gonna ramp up government spending by an amount equal to about 5% of GDP. We don't need the tax to pay for that. Might we need to add a tax to prevent that spending from becoming inflationary? Mm. That is possible, okay? So I think we need to continue to uh, work on this. I think with the slack we have today, it's not necessary. Now, I think that even uh, people who are um, sympathetic to the MMT would still say, again, with unemployment as low as it is now, and you say it can go lower, but it's, it's low by historical standards, yeah. um, and capacity utilization pretty high, to add a, a lot of spending on new forms of energy and add a lot of jobs through a jobs guarantee mm -hmm. would push the economy beyond its limits. They're just, all the slack would be used up and we would be into an inflationary environment. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's an empirical question, right? So first, uh, <clears throat> as we start to implement the Green New Deal programs, we need to look at what kinds of resources will they demand, Right. okay? And we will be releasing some resources, let's say that we do move away from petroleum and towards solar, we're gonna release, release some resources and we're gonna employ some resources. And so we need to look at resources that will be released and where can we put those in the Green New Deal uh, program and, uh, you know, do as careful a calculation as we possibly can. And then if we decide that, you know, actually we are going to put too much pressure on resources, we're going to have to figure out how do we release more resources. And taxes are one way to do it. Um, we could uh, go back to um, the uh, World War II experience and what we learned from that. Now, Think about it this way. <clears throat> World War II was a challenge to the U.S. economy. In some ways, Green New Deal is a similar challenge. In some ways, it's even a more important challenge than World War II was uh, because possibly human survival depends on it. Um, during World War II, we moved 50% of GDP to the war effort. 50%, mm -hmm. okay, and I'm saying that by our calculations, we're talking about 5% for the Green New Deal. We handled 50% last time. The budget deficit reached 25% of GDP. Okay, you know, we've been running budget deficits of 5%. In the depths of the global financial crisis, we reached 10%. World War II reached 25% budget deficit. We managed to keep inflation low during World War II. It was the first major war we had mm. without high inflation, okay? Because we had a plan, okay? We used postponed consumption. That's what that patriotic saving was. That's what the deal made uh, among government, labor union, and employers were. We're gonna give you retirement. We're gonna postpone your consumption. We're not gonna give you a wage increase now. We're gonna give you a better retirement in the future. Okay, that's what we did. That's something we can do this time too. People need better retirements and we, we could say, you're not gonna get a wage increase during this Green New Deal push, but you're gonna get it later. You can use rationing, you can use taxes. And when you modeled, I don't know if you modeled all of this that you just explained, but what would be the time horizon then for you know, all of these policies going, you know, being unfurled? Well, a lot of people are using a decade, and so we used a decade. Okay. It looks like maybe we have a dozen years. If we don't do it, right. we're in big trouble. 
Okay, so we used a decade. The, uh, there would be more sort of um, resorting to a planning board, right? Isn't MMT involved having planners who would estimate supply and demand and constraints and so on and tweak the, tweak the knobs based on that rather than being completely laissez-faire? There's no such thing as laissez-faire in the real world. Okay. Everything is always planned. Right. It's always planned. The question is who does the planning? Okay. And for the Green New Deal, we are going to need guidance from the federal government. This is something we can't leave to individual corporations to try to plan. And um, of course, the labor union power is very much reduced. Uh, so it's not a matter of just corporations and unions negotiating. The federal government's going to have to play a role in uh, to have a successful Green New Deal. We're going to need some planning. But beyond just the Green New Deal, I'm talking about generally macroeconomic policy. How does it get set? I mean, one big difference we haven't talked about yet <coughs> is that you see very different roles for fiscal versus monetary policy. Well, as I think the world has learned over the past uh, dozen years, monetary policy is extremely weak. And by the way, monetary policy, of course, is setting interest rates. Yeah, I mean, there are other things we could include in monetary policy, regulation and so on, yeah. that um, also has, been, uh, has not been done very well yeah. uh, in the lead up to the global financial crisis and then afterward. So but yeah, let, let's cutting rates doesn't really get an economy going. I would say it goes beyond my theory. It's, it's a fact. Okay. <laughs> this is just a bold fact that everyone now recognizes. You know, you can lower interest rates to zero. What, how many, what is it? There's 12 trillion sure. of government bonds with negative rates right now in the world. Read right. Business Week And this you week. still <laughs> can't get inflation <laughs> yeah. going. Come on. Lowering rates doesn't do it. And why not, by the way, according to MMT? Business have to see uh, profitability right. in the future. It doesn't, so what if I can borrow, of course I'm not gonna borrow, a corporation is not gonna borrow at a negative rate. It's a, the, the governments are issuing debt at negative rates. Um, even if I only have to pay 3%, I mean, I, I can go buy houses right now at 3.75%. Am I out there buying more houses? No, I think we've hit the peak and I think they're gonna go down. So lowering the interest rate isn't gonna do it. And it doesn't do it. They've been trying to get inflation up to 2% and they can't do it. And this is a global problem. Now, there's Venezuela and a few places that manage to get inflation. I'm talking about the developed Use world. price controls and exchange controls <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> the developed world has not yeah. been able to get inflation <clears throat> even with ZERP and with trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of quantitative Quantity. easing. Yeah didn't work. We said it won't work. It did not work. So that means that puts more weight on fiscal policy, taxing sure. and spending. Only fiscal policy works. Right. Monetary policy, I would even go further than saying it doesn't work. It could be that we're mistaking the brake pedal for the gas pedal and vice versa. We're not even sure which direction it works, I would say. Um, I don't think there's good evidence that raising rates slows things down or that lowering rates speeds things up. Mm -hmm. There isn't good evidence for this. Um, fiscal policy works. And uh, many people who thought monetary policy would work have come around to this. Yeah, fiscal policy works. Now what happens if you start getting higher than desired inflation and the government says, okay, folks, we're gonna raise your taxes. Mm -hmm. It strikes me as a highly unpopular yeah. policy. It'll be hard to yeah. enforce. Yeah, uh, what you want is automatic stabilizers um, because their discretion takes time and it takes time to get a tax bill through Congress and taxes are not popular. So what you want is um, automatic stabilizers. The job guarantee is an example of an automatic stabilizer. The spending automatically goes up when the private sector lays workers off automatically goes down when the private sector hires those workers back out of the job guarantee program. Uh, progressive income taxes are automatic stabilizers. They, when income is growing rapidly, you move into higher tax brackets and the uh, uh, tax, total tax revenue will go up. Our tax system actually 
does its job. Uh, people, <clears throat> well, now I have not lo looked carefully after the uh, Trump uh, changes. But before that, if you looked, any time the economy grew at a good pace, five or six percent of GDP, federal tax revenue exploded and was growing at 16 percent per year. Okay, that's what you want. We've already got it. Our tax system maybe even takes too much out mm -hmm. when we grow rapidly. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, during the global financial crisis, it all reversed. Tax revenue just fell through the floor when the economy uh, dipped into the recession. Yeah. So our tax system already does this. We don't need to change the tax law. Okay. It does it automatically, which is what you want. Well, we don't want to monopolize you in terms of questions because I know we have people who've been sending questions in. So why don't we just open up the floor to uh, some of uh, our viewers today. Um, and I see one recurrent theme in the questions that are coming up is, is are there sort of constraints or limits to how much debt or, or the, the size of the deficits that the U.S. could carry under an MMT <clears throat> scenario? Well, okay, financial affordability is not an issue. And so whether the debt ratio is a U.S. 100% of GDP or a Japanese 250% of GDP, our governments can always make the interest payments on that debt. So there's no magic ratio. Okay, we can always make the payments. Um, the, uh, the budget deficit is uh, largely, uh, we say, endogenously determined by the performance of the economy. When our economy grows rapidly, the budget deficit goes down. And so the amount of debt that's issued uh, declines. And if we grow fast enough, the debt ratio will go down. When we slow down, the debt ratio will go up because the budget deficit increases and GDP is not growing rapidly. So the debt ratio will go up. So it sort of adjusts on its own. We can always make the interest payments. Um, there, there is a question about whether you want the government to spend a lot on interest. Uh, right now, when we're at very, very low interest rates, government spending on interest is not very big. Um, if we had a Japanese-like 250% uh, debt ratio, and if we got interest rates you know, up to 8%, government spending on interest would be huge. And uh, in a lot of ways, government spending on interest is very inefficient. It's also uh, re regressive, isn't it? It can be regressive. A lot of it can go abroad. So you're not stimulating your own economy. So it's a very inefficient kind of government spending. And so I, I and many other MMT people uh, do personally think that we don't want to spend a lot on interest. How do you avoid that? Well, the interest rate is always within the discretion of a policy. Mm. So you, you, during World War II, we kept the short-term rate at 3 eighths of 1% all through the war. We, we got the debt ratio up to 100% of GDP with the deficits of 25% of GDP. Interest payment was very low because it was policy to keep the interest rate low. But uh, what about longer term interest rates which are less under the control of the government? They are perfectly under the control of the government. <laughs> uh, so the, the, I, I don't remember what the longer term rate was, but it was 2% more or less. Um, you can uh, keep the long term rate at 2%. So uh, the, the central bank uh, can uh, maintain the interest rate anywhere it wants. And the central bank is a creature of Congress. Okay. Um, I, the, another question that uh, we've received several ones is, um, does MMT depend on the dollar being sort of the, to the foremost reserve currency? Well, obviously not. Australia has the dollar. Australia is a sovereign currency country. A dollar. I know. Their a own dollar. <laughs> the Australian dollar is not the, interna the main international reserve currency. It is an international reserve currency, but Australia is a, s a small, very open economy, and all of the principles of MMT apply to Australia. Okay. So the answer is clearly no. Okay. You don't have to have the US dollar. You can have the Australian dollar. You can have the British pound. You can have the Japanese yen. You can have the Chinese RMB. But you, but you suggested that Europe is in a different... Well, because right. Italy was fine before they joined the euro. Right. 
Italy had the lira. MMT principles applied to Italy. Italy had budget deficits uh, of 100% of GDP. They uh, had you know, m massive interest payments because their central bank was keeping the interest rate at 10%. Um, government still made all the payments as they came due. Everyone thought they were going to default. Warren Mosler actually went over to Italy and told them, you're not going to default. You have a sovereign currency. And uh, the finance minister says, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> they didn't default. Everything was fine. Now they've joined the euro, and now things are very different for them. Now everything depends on the ECB. And there's still worries about default. <laughs> well, now well, there are. Yeah, more, yeah. There are, yeah. because it will depend they, on the ECB. Right. Um, the, um, I'm just going to ask you a question about the uh, constraints again. Um, one of the concerns is that uh, overspending might cause a crisis of confidence. Uh, is that something to be concerned about? Well, uh, concerned, I guess. I mean, it's something to consider. We are so far away from that point. So I know people say, well, you know, we could become Venezuela. Think about that. Really? Do you, is that a, a serious worry that we're going to become Venezuela? Well, you know, Venezuela did not meet the conditions that I laid out at the very beginning. Um, yes, they had their own currency, but they're pegging to the dollar. They had lots of dollar-denominated debt. They basically produce one thing that they sell, and they sell it for dollars, and it seemed safe. Okay, we got oil revenue, comes in dollars, so we can issue dollar debt. Hey, what happens if the price of oil collapses? You're in big trouble. Yeah. Okay, we're not in that situation. Uh, and none of the other big developed uh, countries are in that situation. And I, I, <clears throat> developing countries face lots of problems that we don't face. Sure. Uh, we are not in danger of becoming one of those countries. It's coming, just not a real. Coming back to what Christina said in her intro, that in the U.S. it seems like both the Democrats and the Republicans are becoming more deficit friendly. And we just had a budget deal announced between Chuck Schumer and Nancy <coughs> Pelosi and Donald Trump that l lifts the uh, debt ceiling and raises spending caps and relaxes a lot of the constraints that were put on in, back in 2011. Um, is that good news to you? Well, sure. The, the, the debt limit is a pretty crazy restriction on the government. Um, it's been in place since 1913. For most of the history since then, it has never been an issue. Congress would just raise the debt limit when they needed to raise it. Um, and occasionally in the distant past, it would become a political issue. And now it's been an almost continual political issue, depending on you know, which party is in power. Um, and the, so the, when the Democrats are in power, the Republicans try to use it. Look, Congress already approved a budget. The president signed it. Uh, you need to raise the debt limit in order to spend according to what you already budgeted. So it's kind of crazy to try to go back and say, well, we approved that budget, but now we've changed our mind because mm -hmm. of the debt. Yeah. When the debt grows simply because of the operating procedures we've adopted that allow the Treasury to spend. Okay? We, we could change those operating procedures uh, and stop issuing debt. It's perfectly possible. We can just leave the reserves in the banking system. It's sort of a permanent quantitative easing. That's an alternative to issuing bonds into the markets. The markets won't like that. Markets like government debt, you know. So Congress would have to deal with the, the market reaction. Hey, why are you taking away our government bonds? We love government bonds. But we've got this crazy debt limit that prevents uh, the Treasury from issuing the bonds the markets want and that are necessary to allow the Treasury to spend according to the budget Congress already approved. So it's a crazy limit. I, I don't think other, no country I know of has this except the United States. It, you can sort of understand why they did it back in 1913, but it's a very bad idea mm -hmm. now. Do you have more questions? Well, I mean, it makes me think, though, even though you say they don't have a constraint, I mean, I think what 
to my mind, when I grew up in Argentina, what would be more palatable about you know trying out MMT in a in a country like the U.S. is that there are checks and balances in the system. You know, so um, I think that it sounds like it's just not really a great option for developing countries for various reasons, not just governance, but also because sometimes they may you know they're they're maybe overly dependent on you know, single streams of revenue that are denominated in another currency or that they're semi-pegged. Um, oh, they owe money in other currencies. Yeah, that's right. right. Well, first, owing money in other currencies is probably almost always a bad idea. Governments should not do that. Governments should not issue debt in uh, foreign currencies. I, I think that the uh, citizens should impose that on their government, say, we don't want you to do that. Because there's no uh, generally accepted international bankruptcy procedures for governments. Right. Uh, so it's okay to let your corporations do it because we can handle it through bankruptcy. You can't do that for governments. Yet it's almost a, a cachet to it. You know, India is preparing to do its first international bond offerings. The country had never done them before. And it's, it's, you know, people are sort of saying, oh, it's a sign of maturity, you know. Well, it's fine if they do it in their own currency because they can always make the payments in their own currency. Now, other things about MMT, you know, was developed to look at sovereign currency countries. So we are talking about the biggest developed rich countries. So most of our focus has been on that. Uh, now, Australia is a small country, and Bill Mitchell has written on uh, countries that are outside uh, the, the big, rich, developed countries. <clears throat> and my former student, uh, Fidel Kaboob, is from a developing country, and he has also applied MMT to, to developing countries. Um, so they're actually, a, part of our literature does deal with their situation, and we're not trying to minimize how difficult it is for a developing country to become a developed country. It's not simply a matter of, okay, now let's just issue our own currency, impose taxes, and only issue debt in our own currency. By itself, that's not going to go a long way toward developing. You, you need to develop your country so you're not relying on one export. Okay? Relying on one export is very dangerous. Export-led growth that relies on one export is very problematic. Yeah. You're probably not going to be successful at developing. Uh, we also advocate floating the currency because if you're not floating your currency, essentially you're really promising to deliver that foreign currency, usually the dollar. So if you're pegging the dollar, your debt really is a promise to deliver dollars right. if you've pegged. And so uh, you're not really free. You don't have a lot of domestic policy space usually. So we prefer floating the currency. But I'm not going to say every country in the world needs to immediately float their currency. Okay. In some cases, this could be a disaster. In some cases, it actually makes sense to manage your exchange rate in the way that China has done. China has very successfully developed while managing their exchange rate. They will float their currency at some point in the future. Okay? But they've adopted a very successful strategy so far. <clears throat> and because they've been so successful at exporting, they, didn't give up, they don't give up any policy space right now, even as they manage their currency. They don't need to worry. No one is going to attack their dollar reserves. Now, they have a little bit of a problem domestically, <laughs> but you're not going to have George Soros attacking uh, China's dollar reserves. It's too big. You know, one thing that strikes me about MMT is that it's almost as much of a political project as an economic one. There are a lot of economic uh, principles here that are uh, fairly mainstream, growing out of John Maynard Keynes and so on, but they've been sort of recast in a different way. It's like you're, you're sort of looking at them from a different perspective and w with the result that you believe there's more fiscal space for spending and so on. But, but because it's a political project, then it needs to be looked at that way for the political feasibility. And so just to pick one, the jobs guarantee, mm -hmm. one of the concerns I would have is that you, you give a lot of, there's a recession, a lot of people get 
jobs uh, through the government. And then the economy recovers, and in order to prevent uh, excess stimulus, you start basically dropping those people off the rolls, which is tough. Even if theoretically they should be able to get a job in the private sector, there's going to be some frictional unemployment, different reasons why they might have trouble finding jobs in the private sector. So one of two things happens. Either you do that and there's a big backlash, and a lot of people are angry that they're being treated as pawns in some big macroeconomic scheme, or you keep them on the payroll, in which case you get that excessive inflation. Well, no, no, no. The way that it works is that as the private sector starts growing again in the recovery, they need workers. Yeah. Where do they go get them? They go shop in the job guarantee program. You have people who are already employed, they have a work history, you know what skills they're learning on the job, you recruit from that. So it's all completely voluntary. It's not that the government says, you and you and you, you're fired. Okay. No, no, no. They stay in the program until a good offer comes along. So the, the private sector recruits out. Well, I can see that that does solve one problem. It creates a different problem, which is now that that government jobs program becomes the place where people go when they have no better alternative, which doesn't feel like a good way for the federal government to do its job. Yeah, but you, you have to compare you know, apples to apples, not apples to oranges. Uh, is it better to have them unemployed and uh, losing skills and perhaps picking up bad habits and not having a work record to present to employers Beyond about six months, it becomes very hard to get hired. Um, whether the, the employer's view of them is correct or not, the employers do not want to hire long-term unemployed people uh, or have them employed. Yeah. I think it's better to have them employed. So uh, it, it, could, it could well be true that the private employers would rather hire them from other private employers. Yeah. But the second best option is to hire them from the job guarantee program itself. Now, we, we want these workers to be productive. Yeah. We want them to be learning skills on the job. Sure. We want them to do useful things that benefit society. So, you know, that's the ideal. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you can never reach your ideal, but hopefully we can be close enough with a lot of these workers that they really are doing something useful and uh, learning skills that will be useful in private employment. Okay. Well, unfortunately we're out of time and clearly we could have gone on for longer. People still have a lot of questions. Um, I think one of the best ones that actually came in at the end is, and asked you to put on your predictor hat and said, how long will it take for MMT to become the mainstream economic thinking? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, back 25 years ago, Warren, thought it would be three years. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, so a few more. <laughs> you know, Paul Samuelson, apparently he, he didn't come up with this, but he used to say, economics does make advances one death Oh, that's right. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, the people who learned the orthodox economics are most likely they're not going to change their minds. But the young students coming up who are being exposed to MMT, they're going to carry that with them. Uh, I had a, a student who uh, one day, last day of class, brought in these glasses that, that, that change your vision, you know, completely different. He made everyone put them on. He says, this is what MMT is like. Uh -huh. He said, once you've seen it, your view of the world changes. Huh. And you will never go back to the other way of thinking. And so uh, gradually, uh, MMT will win out because it's correct. E eventually, uh, the, the correct views win out. We, we don't have many people who still think the Earth is flat. Eventually, you know, the, the people who believed it was flat die out, and the same will happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. All right, thanks for returning. Uh, so what did you think? Did it get you everything you wanted to know about MMT? Eh, probably not. It's a huge subject and you can't really do it in half an hour. So what questions do you have? Make comments in the, just below or send us a private email. Let us know, you know, where do you want to take your MMT knowledge? How far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? 
And this is to me is the point. Everyone, as far as I'm concerned, needs to know at least a little bit of something. People ask me all the time, you know, knowing me as they do, hey Jeff, if you could have one thing, I'm sure you'd probably want Medicare for all, right? No, if I could only have one thing, just the one thing, I want everyone to understand modern monetary theory. And a basic understanding doesn't take much. Quite honestly, what Randy just said should be sufficient to at least make everyone understand what the limitations are for federal spending. It's not financial to a monetary sovereign like the United States that issues its own currency, taxes and borrows exclusively in that currency, uh, does not have significant foreign debt, and does not peg its currency. You are resource constrained. You are not financially constrained. Whatever is physically possible to do is financially affordable to the monetary sovereign. Not to states, not to municipalities or corporations, and certainly not to you and me. Everyone else uses the currency. Everyone else has to acquire it somehow, either through earning or taxing if you're a state. It doesn't matter. You have to get it first before you can determine what you can do with what you just acquired. To the monetary sovereign, cost is at best secondary. The first and most important question is, can I do it? Do I have the stuff? You can't simply pay for a building if you don't have the materials to build it. To have the money to do it is meaningless if you don't have the materials. So do you have the materials? If you do, the monetary sovereign can always afford to pay. And if everyone understands that, then I am confident, 100% confident, that we will have single-payer health care, that we will have a federal job guarantee, that we will have the Green New Deal and forever end climate change. Because once people understand what's possible, and once they understand the necessity for it, then we will have it because people will demand it. I am convinced that the only reason we don't have these things is because oligarchs and neoliberals have for 40 years been spoon feeding us a gold standard lie that the federal government is just like you and me, just like a household, can only pay what it takes in. That every bit of federal expenditure has to be matched with tax dollars. We end that cycle we end that connection in the minds of people, and everything is possible. So spread the word. Make sure people know. Break that connection. Make sure that people understand that taxation and spending at the federal level are two different operations. And then we win. See you next week.